Welcome, everybody. I'm Carla Millette, Interim Director of the Center for European Studies. Um, Happy New Year. This is our first, the Center's first event of the new year. Um, before I introduce our speaker for today, I wanted to make a couple of announcements about events that we have coming up just in the next couple of weeks. A week from today, January 19th, uh, Igor Gordiancic, a visiting scholar in residence from the European University Institute in, in Florence, uh, um, will give a talk entitled Pension Policy in Central and East Europe Reforms and Reversals. Um, the next week, uh, January 26th, we are delighted to, uh, to welcome the EU ambassador to the U.S., Joao Valle de Almeida, and uh, the Danish ambassador to the U.S., Peter uh, Taxo Jensen, who will give a presentation, a joint presentation, I imagine, entitled The Future of Europe from Economic Crisis Recovery to Sustainability Leadership. Um, and that's uh, at 12 noon. Um, in the Educational Conference Center, which is the one on the other end of this floor, right, in this building, room 1840 in this building. I'm very much looking forward to that event. Today, um, we are welcoming Jens Albert, who received his PhD in Sociology and Political Science at the University of Mannheim. He specializes in the social structure of European societies, gender, welfare, and inequality in Germany and in the United States. He has taught at um, Universitat Constance, Universitat du Cône, and he was also a guest lecturer, also has been a guest lecturer at several U.S. universities, including MIT, um, Wisconsin at Madison and Cornell, where in 2011 he held the Luigi Einaudi chair. His most recent uh, publications include Family and the Welfare State in Europe, Intergenerational Relations in Aging Societies with Agnes Blom and Wolfgang Kacht, and um, United in Diversity, Comparing Social Models in Europe and America, which was co-edited with Neil Gilbert. Um, and he's written a number of articles as well. He um, is it has it has an appointment at the uh, i'm going i'm going to pronounce this i will i'll say this word wissenschaftszentrum berlin zur sozialforschung something like that <laughs> I just humiliated myself in my efforts to pronounce German. Okay, with that, and his title, his talk today is uh, is entitled "How the European Union Weakens the European Social Model and What the EU Could Learn from the U.S." Please join me in welcoming Jens Alpe. Hello, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here in Michigan again, mm -hmm. where I was as, the first time as an exchange student at a high school in the 1960s. And it's a great pleasure to be here and be able to sing Hail to the Victors again yeah. in a time when it makes sense after having won the Sugar Bowl. So that was really great to, to be able to come here. Um, I take it that uh, the announcement of my title was a bit different, but it's a welcome opportunity to say, uh, if you're going to sleep for the rest of the time, at least something like a thesis sentence at the beginning, because I would say the title you announced, uh, you saw announced, suggested what the European uh, social models can learn from the U.S. And my thesis sentence in a way is, I would think, the European nation states have little to learn from the U.S., which tells you something about my, my normative perspective also, of course, but the European Union would have to le learn a lot from the US. And this is what I hope to clarify a bit. So what I want to do is proceed in five steps, tell you briefly uh, what I would perceive as a meaningful definition of the notion of a European social model, then discuss briefly how that idea uh, conforms to social reality when we look at similarity uh, and at convergence over time then discuss three types of policy challenges. The, three, the first two you're definitely familiar with, external challenges from globalization, internal uh, challenges from demographic change mostly. But my focus will be on the last time, uh, on the last aspect, supranational challenges on the level of the EU. When I presented that to an Irish colleague uh, uh, a year ago or so, he said, you know, we never heard of this before. So it's basically um, based on a German debate, but uh, I hope that some of this will be new to you. Then I'll discuss some of the limits to effective social legislation on the European level, and finally about some uh, scenarios for reform and potential lessons from the US. Um, and. Uh, I'm always impressed when I see bumper stickers here. I love my country, but I hate my government. 
And I think we are moving into a direction where Europeans are likely to come up with saying, I love Europe, but I hate brothels. <laughs> OK, what does the notion of the European social model mean? Everybody who studies the welfare state uh, knows there's a, a, last ver uh, a vast variety of social models in Europe, so why do we speak of one European social model? I think because it's a normative idea that the EU aspires to, and the normative idea is something that I call the idea that we in the EU should be something like the USA plus. And the USA plus means this. We share a number of key properties of societies and states with the United States. And I would definitely say we are family. We are the West. But in addition to these properties, we have something in addition that uh, makes uh, societies worth living in. That's the normative claim. It doesn't mean that this is actually the case. But the idea is, together with the US, we are liberal, pluralistic democracies, but we are also democracies with redistributive welfare states. And I think that is a notion that is not contested in Europe. I'm, I'm really um, Im profoundly impressed by what I see on television in the primaries now. Totally different concepts of the state in Europe and the US. Um, in the dimension of the economy, we are both uh, dynamic market economies, but the European idea is to have the dynamic market economy coupled with a corporatist social dialogue with the associations of business and labor that make for rather peaceful labor relations and for pretty high quality jobs. And finally, in the dimension of the society, the idea is that we do not only provide, as the United States, ample individual opportunity, but that we also provide for security and social cohesion through social security schemes and anti-poverty measures. So I think the normative idea is all European societies should share this to some extent, and in this sense, they should be visibly different from the United States in having this, these plus elements. OK, if this is the normative idea, the question is, how does it conform to reality? And uh, I just want to uh, look briefly at some key aspects, first on a, a cross-sectional basis, saying how much similarity is there, and then on a longitudinal perspective, how much convergence do we see? Is it, it's quite interesting. Uh, we had a podium discussion, uh, which we uh, organized at the Social Science Research Center in Berlin, and we had a long-serving commissioner of the European Union. I won't tell you now who it was. Um, and he said, the European countries are very similar. They uh, all have very similar social expenditure ratios. Quite stunning how a commissioner of the EU can have such a distorted image of the reality in the European Union. The original six countries that formed the European Common Market were very similar in terms of GDP per head, similar prosperity, in terms of Bismarckian type social insurance schemes, and uh, similar institutional design also with respect to labor relations. Uh, the various steps of enlargement have cha changed this profoundly. First, the southern enlargement, but then the eastern enlargement particularly. So if we look at the social expenditure ratios as one of the key indicators of welfare state expansion today, we see, in contrast to what our commissioner said, a ver variation by factor almost 3, 2.7. That is, we have a social expenditure ratio, 29% in Sweden on top, and 11% in, in Latvia. That's a vast margin of variation. And the commissioner comes, uh, we have similar expenditure ratios. Uh, the coverage ratio of collective bargaining agreements varies by factor eight from above 90% in countries like um, Austria or Slovenia to 12% in Lithuania. And the income poverty ratio, relative income poverty, who lives below 50% of the um, um, median household income, 
varies between 5% in the Czech Republic and 19% in Latvia, also practically by a factor of four. So I always tell my students, if there's one thing you want to remember about Europe, it is Europe is diversity, stunning diversity. And if we look at developments over time, we also find rather continuing diversity and neither convergence nor divergence. I will briefly show you some of the data. Um, if we look at public social spending, this is what we see on top, the Scandinavian countries and the continental European countries are pretty similar with uh, social expenditure ratios above 25%, around 25%. Um, and uh, the uh, two uh, enlargement sets, if you wish, Southern Europe with very different patterns. Southern Europe, this is the average of countries grouped in this family of nations, marked by a catching up process, no race to the bottom, but the new member states really going down and approximating the American levels. Uh, this is OECD data, this is EU data, so not quite compatible. Yes? Is that just the American national government? Yes. No, no, no. This is total social spending in the U.S. The yes. Uh, so catch up, race to the bottom, if you wish. Okay. In the two uh, enlargement countries, different uh, uh, groups, different patterns. It looks very similar with respect to uh, public revenues. I'll skip that for reasons of time. Also, persistent families of nations here, rather than uh, convergence or divergence, just in passing. What is, is stunning for a European, uh, if we see this country here, constantly discussing that socialism is uh, looming around the corner, uh, the U.S. is the country with the lowest tax ratio in the tax revenue ratio in the in the in the OECD. Um, so, I keep saying what I've learned here. I've been here now for six months. Um, I continue to think we are the West. I continue to to think we are family. But whereas I came by saying we are the West, we are siblings, and there's sibling rivalry. Today I say we are family, but we are cousins. It's the, the, this, the discourse, the public policy discourse is really stunningly different. Okay, that's just in passing. We find mixed results with respect to employment ratios and um, labor relations. You see, with respect to um, employment, that was always considered the dark side of the European social model to the degree of it persists. As Tony Blair, Gordon Brown said, Europe does not work. And what they meant by Europe does not work means Europe produces long-term unemployment, not only high unemployment, but high long-term unemployment, always used to be higher than uh, uh, in the United States. Remem uh, re remark, however, the past tense, always used to be higher. Um, and uh, the employment rates were lower. So the European official goal was move the uh, Lisbon strategy, move the employment rate of the population 15 to 64 to 70 percent. And this is one of the few dimensions where we see convergence processes. Um, the Scandinavian countries have overtaken the US. The continental European countries have approximated the US. Britain and Ireland are close now. Um, Netherlands and Luxembourg uh, are close. And um, even the new member states, which had some downturn at the beginning, are beginning to catch up. So there's some convergence. And uh, you cannot say Europe does not work uh, to the same degree that uh, Blair and, and Brown were able to say that in the early 2000s. With respect to industrial relations, a very interesting pattern shows up if we look at two dimensions. Longitudinal uh, data are still hard to come by, even though Jelle Visser at the University of Amsterdam, who has also retired uh, the, one of the past months, so we are the same age cohort, um, has produced a great data set on union density and labor relations, but even there are some gaps. So I look here at cross-sectional data, and what you see here is this. There is a recent trend, Fisser's work describes that, uh, to, toward a decline of unionization and the coverage of collective bargaining agreements in Europe. Both are going down. 
And in this sense, the European idea of a social dialogue between business and labor has come under stress, especially after the Eastern enlargement. And this is what I want to show you here, and I tell my students, I'm always trying to find catch words or catch sentences that they can remember easily. Think of this paradox. The Eastern enlargement has shifted the center of gravity in the European Union westward. What does that mean? It means exactly this. Where do we find the Eastern European new member states? In the same box as the UK and the US. So they have moved westward. They are in foreign relations Atlanticists. And in labor relations, very low union density, that's the average union density, very low bargaining coverage, co bu coverage of collective bargaining agreements. So they're in a bunch with the Western countries, the Atlantic countries. In this sense, the center of political gravity has shifted westward due to the Eastern enlargement. And um, that is something you know from your own research. Uh, Danzigers are here, of course, uh, also. Um, in terms of uh, inequality and poverty, we have seen increasing inequality in the European Union. The OECD came out with two, pub two top publications, Growing Unequal in 2008. Now, a few months ago, Divided We Stand in 2011, showing that everywhere, including Sweden, inequality has increased rather impressively uh, over the past two decades. So, in sum, this section on reality tells us that European countries tend to deviate from the US in the sense that most of them are a bit apart from the US. Um, they have higher social spending, they have higher taxes, they have different labor relations, they have less poverty and inequality. But within Europe, we find persistent diversity and at best different families of nations rather than one European social model. And there are no signs of convergence outside the one indicator employment rates that we have been looking at. Some uh, observers, like Wickham in, in Ireland, um, says, uh, when he sees this, uh, this kind of data, he says, the end of the European social model because before it began, is a title of a paper he wrote for the European trade unions. Uh, the question then is, to what extent do differences that distinguish the EU from the US in this plus element of the equation persist and to what extent are they sustainable? This brings me to my third section, challenges. Briefly, two challenges you're all familiar with, globalization, host of an industry of empirical studies, mixed results, and I would say basically the mixed results uh, a reflection of the conceptual ambivalence. Yes, generous welfare states and tightly regulated labor relations tend to drive capital away into cheap labor countries with less regulation, but welfare state spending and welfare state regulation tend to come in, in a package with some of the aspects that are attractive uh, um, to capital, and Graham Room in England has worked on that. Good governments, good governance, ensuring stable property rights. A well-developed infrastructure, not only in terms of transportation ways, but also public services that meet the demands of the cultural demands of the creative class, and a highly trained, well-educated labor force that boosts productivity. So these things come, tend to come in a package. I always tell my kids, life comes in packages. Um, <coughs> And this is maybe why we find this ambiguity in, find in, in, in studies depending on the exact set of countries, the time period, and uh, the control variables that are entered into the regression equations. I think uh, the second type of challenge, the internal challenge to which po uh, Paul Pearson here in the US, Esping Anderson in, in Spain and Denmark have drawn at our attention, are more challenging, and these are the uh, challenges from demography and um, from the post-industrial pattern of employment. Uh, the first means that um, basically we now have a ratio in the EU average 
four persons at working age per one retiree. Forecasts to 2050 say this will shrink below to 1.9 on average. And most severely affected by this demographic change will be the Czech Republic, Germany, and Italy. And the other thing is the uh, uh, post-industrial employment uh, pattern with more female employment, more part-time employment, more difficulties for uh, the unions to mobilize that puts uh, the uh, corporatist uh, bargaining pattern in Europe under strain. But this is very well-known territory, especially in the United States. Um, Pearson was really one of the guys who pointed the, the second internal challenges out, uh, probably uh, in the most explicit way. Today, I really want to draw your attention to something that is hardly discussed so far outside Germany, where a real discussion has begun, as I will show you, the supranational challenges resulting from EU policies. Now, it's very important when we talk about policymaking in the European Union to distinguish between two types of policymaking. Highly visible political decisions made in the European Council and by the European Parliament, and the much less visible judicial decisions, not politicized, not publicized, made by the European Commission and by the European Court of Justice. Um, developing a European social model is uh, particularly difficult because um, the decision-making in the Council still requires a, a unanimity in the field of uh, social policy. And even if they move to qualified majority, qualified majority decisions would bring a legitimation problem. Because governments that promise their, home, their domestic voters we will vote against this in the council would then be bound to respect the directives of the European Union and there would be a legitimation gap in their decision making. And in this situation, a distinction first made by the Dutch economist Jan Tinbergen and recently developed by the German political scientist Fritz Scharf is very important. Tinbergen and Scharf distinguish between negative integration and positive integration. Negative integration means deregulation, abolition of national provisions that impede the free movement of people, goods, and services. Okay? Market making, if you wish, but even though it's not 100% synonym. Positive integration, that would mean a buildup of new institutions that harmonize the currently very diverse social policies are practically impossible because it is so hard to find in these diverse models a consensus of unanimity required in the European Council. And um, in this situation, actions of the Commission and of the European Court of Justice against infringements of the treaty obligations become the prime mover in the European Union because they do not require anything other than an interpretation of the already existing treaty obligations. That's all in the treaty. No change needs to be made. It needs to be interpreted. And the Commission can sue national states, national member states before the European Court of Justice for not meeting the requirements in the treaty. And according to Tinbergen and Scharpf, the main beneficiary of this negative integration in European unpoliticized uh, uh, supranational lawmaking is deregulation market making. And a new, uh, a, a new uh, ruling by the European Court or a decision by the Commission can only be overcome if, again, a wide coalition of diverse national interests uh, coalesces uh, uh, for a new alternative much more difficult than a single party 
or a coalition government in a single member state. Now, I want to examine the roles of the two key actors in this judicial decision making a bit more specifically. Let's first look at the Commission and then at the European Court of Justice. The Commission has played a changing and inconsistent role over time. Um, sometimes it has highlighted the USA elements in my USA plus formula. And for short periods, it has focused on the plus element. But the red thread over the years is the US side of the formula. Um, and um, this has to do with two things. First, the structural inconsistency of decision making on the European level. We have basically two directorates that play a very active role in social policy. The Directorate General for Employment, Social Affairs and Equal Opportunities, where cohesion and equality is defined exclusively in national terms. Frequently a, disc uh, a criticism that American scholar, scholars make in Europe and they say, oh, you're always talking about your low poverty rates. What if you took the EU average rather than the national average as your yardstick, then you would also have our, in some countries, our levels of poverty, relative income poverty, which is true. But the DG for regional policy that uh, publishes every year the cohesion reports has a EU-wide yardstick of social cohesion. And social cohesion in this respect is defined as similarity or proximity to the European mean. It's GDP per capita dis, uh, discussed and presented in purchasing power parities in euros. And then you have the 100 line as the average. And then you see the difference between Bulgaria, Romania, up to Luxembourg by factor seven. Okay. And these two very different notions of what social integration and cohesion means, a favorable position in the national distribution of incomes, or a, a position close to the European average on the European level means that consistent social policies have not come up in the EU, which has this Janus-headed approach national Europe, European wide okay but in addition to that there are phase specific inconsistencies and they probably have to do with the commissioners uh, uh, and their uh, uh, composition in the early 1990s uh, we had a period where the US side was the one in the formula we are the country the continent producing uh, long-term unemployment we have too little work. Our uh, social welfare schemes are fiscally strained. So the commission came up with its green paper, with its white paper, and basically the message was, let's emulate America and become dynamic. Okay? And cheers from Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, of course. And this was reiterated in the councils of Lisbon and Stockholm. Stockholm added the ecological dimension. Um, Lisbon uh, formulated this employment goal 70%. And only in a very short intermission, we had the council meetings in Laken and Barcelona that emphasized the virtues of social inclusion and of European social protection. My colleague Martin Potucek from, uh, uh, the, uh, from Charles University in Prague, he always says, the fact that Laken and Barcelona only came up after the accession and for almost a decade, we were under pressure to become market economies. The US side of the formula shaped our domestic policies incredibly. Um, and this was only a short period because then the two Koch reports, 2003 and uh, 2005, uh, again focused on growth, competitiveness in a global economy and full employment. So there has been considerable oscillation in the policies pursued by the Commission. 
uh, which sometimes gravitate towards the plus side, but most of the time towards the US side in the formula. The role of the other key actor may even be more important and is almost totally overlooked so far, and that's the European Court of Justice. <coughs> Early accounts, mostly of American and British scholars, Joseph Weiler at the New York uh, University, um, have highlighted the positive functions of the court in promoting European integration. And Caporoso and Taro, in a paper published in 2009, stressed the empowering of individuals against nation states, thanks to the European Court of Justice. Um, but the recent German debate focused on five major, major problems. The first is, first criticism is, the European Court of Justice has <coughs> formulated the primacy of EU law over national law and stretched the scope of the treaties far beyond anything you can ever find in the treaties. And the two crucial steps were here, the um, Van Gent Laws decision in 1962, uh, which now I quote said, the community constitutes a new legal order of international law for the benefit of which the states have limited their sovereign rights. And uh, the Costa Enel decision later reiterated this by saying, quote again, the member states have limited their sovereign rights and have thus created a body of law which binds both their nationals and themselves. The case is frequently totally unobserved because petty stuff. Could one importer produ uh, import a cassis from France uh, or could, would it have to be, uh, would it have to uh, conform to Belgian or German standards? Always petty things. But these two decisions, of which, as you will realize, I forgot the details too, um, were the uh, enshrinement of these principles. EU law breaks national law. Um, and from departing from this uh, basis, the court has really stretched the competences far beyond the treaties. Let's look at social assistance, for example. Social assistance is our uh, poverty relief scheme in Europe. We uh, mostly call that social <coughs> assistance. Here the court ruled in cases of a French student in Belgium, a French citizen in Belgium, uh, uh, in, in, uh, um, also in Belgium. Can somebody be expelled because the person is dependent upon the National Social Assistance Scheme? The original concept of the freedom of movement in the European Union was limited to economically active people. Now the question came up, well, what if they cannot earn their living? Can they resort to the National Assistance Scheme? And the court decision said, basically they boil down to saying, in no case can the right simply be denied because of the recourse to the host member's Social Assistance Scheme. Now mind you this, these national schemes are financed exclusively by national taxpayers. And they are now opened to transnational access from everybody in the European Union. Think of something in the American debate, unfunded mandate, right? Um, in the field of labor relations, the, core, uh, the, the court went even further. Three examples here, very famous cases, the Laval case, the Viking case, the Rufford case. Uh, the, the first case, the Laval case, is a Latvian construction firm builds a school in, in Sweden. The Swedish Union say, a public school in Sweden, uh, they must respect the labor relations, the, the, the collective bargaining agreements. They don't do that. The unions sue. Uh, the, the unions uh, 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 have strike action, and the company sues the unions before the European Court of Justice. European Court of Justice uh, comes up and says, yeah, freedom uh, to strike is an important uh, 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 right. And uh, more important in our context, the treaty explicitly says, 
in its Article 153, Treaty of the Functions of the European Union, the field of labor relations is exempted and the provisions of this article sh shall not apply to pay the right of association, the right to strike, or the right to impose lockouts. That's the text of the treaty. The court comes and says, yeah, this is an important, um, uh, this is an important freedom um, and an important exemption, but we must uh, clarify one thing. Even exempted rights have to be reconciled with the obligations imposed by community law. So, two separate shoes. Does the treaty say the EU has the competence to legislate in the field of labor relations? No. But the court says, yeah, but the obligations of the freedoms of movement cannot be imperiled. That's the overriding uh, right. Very similar conflict with the Finnish vessel uh, flagged out to Estonia. Again, the Finnish unions wanted to have the Finnish labor law, uh, the fi Finnish collective agreement respected. The court ruled now if the company has it according to Estonian rules, that's fine. Even more interesting is the German case because this is uh, a prison in Lower Saxony, the state of Lower Saxony. We have 16 states. Um, and um, the law says anybody who applies uh, or participates in a tender for a, a public contract beyond, I don't know what, what number of millions of euros, has to respect the labor agreements in that area. The uh, German firm hires a Polish subcontractor that pays one half of the local rates. The uh, union sue and say this is a law uh, finish, uh, passed in the, in the uh, uh, parliament of Lower Saxony. The European court says, yeah, but um, this violates uh, European law. So the legislative competence of the EU and the realm of applicability of EU law must be considered two very different shoes. Um, the third cr uh, criticism is that court rulings amount to a gradual destabilization of national programs which continue to be fin financed exclusively by national taxpayers to transnational access. We talked about the social assistance cases already. In healthcare, there's a number of si similar rulings. Maybe the most famous case is Mrs. Watts in Britain. Mrs. Watts in Britain wants a hip replacement. She's on the waiting list for the National Health Service. She doesn't want to wait that long. She moves to Belgium. She has her hip replacement done in Belgium. The National Health Service says, excuse me, I just uh, get rid of my jacket. Um, the National Health Service says, no prior authorization, we don't pay this. Mrs. Watts sues the uh, National Health Service before the European Court, the European Court rules Yes, the National Health Service does not know reimbursement because it's free at the point of delivery in a National Health Service. But if somebody goes to another member state of the European Union and uh, wants to have it done there, the country has to establish a special financial mechanism for this purpose. And if the rates are higher in the other European country, then the country of origin must pay the difference between the origin and the host country rates. And um, it must pay the difference between the service at home and there. Uh, very similar, the university rulings. I pick out the uh, case of Austria here to, to um, <coughs> abbreviate things a little. Austria is a country with something like 8 million people. Neighboring to Germany with something like 82 million people. The Germans have a rule, uh, you can only study medicine if you have a certain grade average. And most applicants fail. Uh, the Austrians don't have this rule. The German students flock to Austrian universities. The Austrian medical uh, uh, graduate schools are totally overrun. Um, uh, Austria wants to uh, raise a fee for German students, 
One of the German students sues the Republic of Austria before the European Court of Justice. The European Court of Justice says either you introduce a fee for everybody or for nobody because we do not make differences between citizens from different states in the European Union. That would be discriminating. Sounds pretty strange to American ears, doesn't it? In-state in tuition, out-of-state tuition, nobody worries about that. Nobody doubts that the United States is a nation state. But of course you have these differences, and they're quite, as you know, especially if you have children, um, they are fairly big, this in-state uh, rates and the out-of-state rates. So no, the European Court of Justice says that cannot be done, even though the EU does not participate in the financing of the schemes. In the US, at least, the federal uh, government contributes to 10%, I've read in the Digest of Education, of American post-secondary education expenditure. So in all these cases, the EU court clear clearly placed the individual right of citizens conceived of as citizens of one European Union over the rights of national taxpayers and thus decoupled the scope of beneficiaries, pan-European, from the scope of financiers, national. And of course made national planning of public services extremely difficult. Um, a fourth uh, criticism is, and there'll only be five, so <laughs> uh, a fourth criticism is that the court rulings are inconsistent and uh, contribute to legal uncertainty. Uh, even some, uh, I'm not a lawyer, I'm a sociologist, but even some of the law, the paper says this uh, ruling is baffling, it's cryptic, it's difficult to reconcile with a, a previous uh, 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 ruling, all quotes. And I think there are two reasons for this. One, again, an interesting uh, dis uh, discrepancy compared to the United States. The European Court of Justice has justices from each member state, so 27. They rule in separate chambers, not in one joint chamber. Uh, the chambers can be uh, uh, mostly consist of only three or five judges. And um, the grand chamber with 13 judges is an uh, exception. The typical case is small chambers, three to five judges. And the individual uh, rulings are not communicated, not made transparent. Uh, if I go to the Cornell, Cornell Yale uh, 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 website, I can read what every uh, Scalia, Thomas, you have them, uh, Breyer uh, ruled, not in the European court. It's only a collegial judgment communicated as such, and the chambers vary. So a structural uh, inconsistency that makes for uh, very inconsistent rulings. The second is uh, related to the unavoidable, if you wish, mode of decision making. The typical mode is, yes, there's a national right that is exempted from EU legislation, like the right to collective bargaining, the right to strike. But then there's the European right of uh, free movement. And now we weigh the two, and we usually rule the European right of free movement is more important. But all the other cases here are different. In these cases, and I'll pick out just one, Schmidt, the Schmidtberger case, to show you the, the typical problems at stake. The Brenner uh, Highway in Austria is the major transit route from Germany, and that means also from the Netherlands, to Italy. Austrian ecologists plan a demonstration against the uh, pollution from this massive uh, trucking uh, activity on this uh, highway. The German uh, transport company sues the Austrian government before the European court and says, Blocking the Brenner uh, Autobahn means you block a major transportation system in Europe that impedes with the Im impinges on the, the free movement of goods, and that is not compatible with European law. The court ruled the freedom, in this case, the freedom of demonstration is more uh, serious and must be respected. But you never know. Maybe the next thing is they say that the German co co-determination laws 
constantly decided upon, passed upon in German Parliament are not compatible with European law. You do not know where, how they balance these things. Okay? These are some cases where they gave priority to the national interest of planning and financing. Okay, where are we? Pretty far already. <coughs> um, now, let's come to the fifth and I think most relevant criticism. You see, Joseph Weiler uh, wrote uh, early in the 1990s uh, that the court is not partisan to the interests of different member states and has left no permanent and fixed member state as winners or losers. But I think this judgment today needs qualification, and that is the qualification that the German debate has brought to the fore. Because all these rulings are not really neutral to national institutions. When it comes to remuneration, collective uh, bargaining is clearly uh, said to be not transparent enough, not clear enough to somebody from another EU country, minimum wage legislation is safe against uh, European abolition. But many countries, especially the Scandinavians and the Germans, based on historic, in Ger in the German case, based on historical experience in the Weimar Republic, do not want the state to be engaged in minimum wage legislation. They wanted to have it collective bargaining. Uh, collective bargaining systems. But that runs the risk that, as the Finnish ferry and the, 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 the uh, Swedish public school and the German prison uh, will be um, not protected by things that are even written in national law. Uh, in healthcare, the logic of the decisions clearly is to favor reimbursement schemes over a national health system that pays uh, that that pays at the uh, uh, that does not remunerate the the expense reimburse the expenditure but uh, delivers at the point of service free of charge and in higher education the dynamic clearly is to introduce tuition fees rather than have higher education as a public service free of charge so i would say if Maurizio Ferreira, the Italian uh, stud, uh, scholar who uh, studied the European Union, says um, the court's rule has m amounts to what uh, Ferreira calls the gloomy spiral of national destructuring without supranational restructuring. I think even this is only half of the truth, because there isn't a restructuring. And the German political scientist Fred Scharf has uh, found a, a very uh, concise way of expressing this, you see. He says, if we de define the, the levels of decision-making, supranational EU or national policy-making uh, in national parliaments, and from social uh, regulation, in my terminology, the plus side of the USA plus formula, uh, to liberalization, the logic of European decision-making, especially by the European Court of uh, Justice and the Commission, that is the depoliticized decision-making, is clearly to move this way. The more European, the more market economy uh, deregulated, uh, not plus uh, side, uh, it will be. Now, um, basically I could stop here. But if you give me five more minutes, I will tell you uh, what I would conclude from this. From here, we could say, OK, we either go and develop a supranational European social model, an effective European social legislation, or we opt for what the British call repatriation, the Germans sometimes call devolution. I think the European strategy is very unlikely for three reasons. Did I have a, a strength? No, I didn't. Um, the first is, I've pointed that already out, the heterogeneity of national uh, interests in the EU. Of course, what is half the pay for German trade union members is higher pay than they get at home for Bulgarian and Romanian workers. And you cannot expect these different uh, interests to come up with a joint uh, a decision. And the majority decisions would facilitate the decision making but create the domestic legitimation problem. The second limit 
has to do with the lack of fiscal resources. You see, public expenditure ratios in the EU, in, in the, in the na individual national member states of the European Union, are somewhere between 30 and 50 percent. Okay? Public expenditure is percent of GDP. 30 to 50 percent. You know what the EU budget is? One limited to 1.24 percent. That is, the European Union doesn't have the means to finance anything. Hence, any regulation will be an unfunded mandate. Um, and a third limit, for which I have a host of data, which I will skip, I will just show you one, is that the European citizens do not go along with the concept of an EU citizenship. They continue to have national mindsets. If you ask them for their collective identity, Eurobarometer question, they never come up with European, but always national. Um, if you uh, ask them uh, where should social policy decisions be made, European level, national level, uh, two-thirds say national level, European level only 15%. And the one thing I want to show you, uh, this is, a, if you wish, a direct test of the Europeanness of the mindsets of Europeans. The European Value Survey asked, when jobs are scarce, employers should give priority to people in where you live, in Germany, to Germans, to Danes. And what you get is a cheer for discrimination. Only three EU member states where more than half of the respondents disagree with the statement. The statement says, let's discriminate. They say, oh, of course we want to discriminate. Reminds me of the Republican debate. Did you see that where they said, imagine somebody hadn't had health insurance and uh, then uh, uh, developed cancer. Should he die? Crowd cheers. Yeah, let him die. OK, let's discriminate. Um, and all NMS new member states are here in this section, where at least two thirds say, let's discriminate. Okay? And in nine of the new member states, less than 20% reject discrimination. Okay? So I frequently say, but that's a different kind of data, the Europeans increasingly have European or international standards of comparison, in the sense that even if they are in the richest quartile in the poor countries, they are less satisfied with their level of living than uh, the members in the lowest quartile of the rich countries. Okay? Highest quartile poor countries, so you're rich. Nationally speaking, you're privileged. Okay? But you're less satisfied with your material living conditions than the poorest in the rich countries. And that, I think, is an indication that we by now have transnational standards of comparison. Everybody sees Woody Allen movies and what do they have, these fancy apartments and all that. Um, maybe it's not Europeanization, maybe it's internationalization. <coughs> but they continue to have national concepts. Their concepts of so uh, social solidarity do not transcend national borders. They want to discriminate between uh, the nationals and the uh, other EU member states. So what is uh, realistic? Some minor things like soft uh, regulation through the open method of coordination, social monitoring processes, maybe shifting the emphasis in the tiny EU budget from subsidies to agriculture and steel, the dying industries, to investments into technology and education. But it's a tiny budget. So I don't think there's much room. Then the question is, well, what about the other direction, devolution? And here I find it interesting that we have very, coming from very different uh, uh, ideological angles, similar ideas in Britain and in Germany. In Britain, the former EU commissioner, Leon Britton, uh, living in Britain, but spelled B-R-I-T-T-A-N, uh, wrote a book, The Europe We Need, in 1994, where he called for a committee of parliaments that would have the power to enforce the principle of subsidiarity. And his idea was this committee of parliaments, if it says this does not respect national lawmakers, that is the principle of subsidiarity sufficiently, allow this committee of parliaments to sue before the European Court of Justice. But the Germans say, well, the European Court of Justice is the perpetrator in a way. You know? uh, so the right to call upon the European Court of Justice may not be the solution. So I give you the two German solutions that recently came up. 
Fritz Scharpf, the political scientist I mentioned, comes up with a rather revolutionary idea. I think no chances to be realized. Um, he says, a national uh, member state, such as Austria in the case of opening access to German students, overrunning the, Ameri uh, the, 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 the Austrian medical faculties, should say, we do not respect this ruling of the European Court, but, but we bow to a politicized decision in the Council. We bring this to the Council, and if the Council decides, then you can talk about major simple majority, absolute majority, whatever, um, that uh, we must respect it, then we will. So his idea is move it from the judicial arena to the political arena, giving the last uh, instance uh, rights to the European Council. More interesting and probably more uh, relevant for real developments is what the European Court the European Constitutional Court, the European Supreme Court in American terminology ruled. They had to decide um, if the uh, uh, Lisbon Treaty is compatible with the German Constitution because some German uh, states and professors, law professors, sued before the European Court, of, uh, before the German uh, Constitutional Court. And it's, it's a complicated um, debate, and I have many quotes for that, but to sum up, the, the German court says two things. First, this idea of a, an EU citizenship is a fiction. The European Union continues to be a union of states, and it does not represent a united people of European citizens. And that means the only sovereign is the national uh, citizens of the separate nation states. And it follows for the European, co uh, for, for the German courts, or, sorry, it follows from the fact that individual nation states have the right to leave the Union, okay? In the treaty, that is an explicit right in the, in the new treaty. And they secondly say there's a basic contradiction in this EU law. The economic concept of the single market pretends anything that makes a distinction between the country of origin is discrimination. We are all Europeans. But the political concept of representation, even though the commission uh, uh, is uh, one, uh, one commissioner per member state, is not proportional representation, but um, degressively proportional representation. So if you count the European uh, uh, population, uh, somebody, a representative from Malta, represents 67,000 European citizens. And a citizen from Germany or France, they are also different population sizes, but the same number of representatives, represents 857,000 people uh, in the European Union. Um, so the court concluded that the peoples of the single member states remain the sole embodiments of the pr principles of democratic sovereignty. What do we and I learn from this? <coughs> First, I think. Uh, it is true that the logic of policy making in the EU is not n institutionally neutral, but amounts to weakening the social market economies, counter to the lip service paid by the EU Commission to the idea, the, the normative idea of a European social model. Secondly, opening nationally designed and financed schemes to transnational access imperils not only the viability of the schemes, but also invites backlash from the European citizens who continue to have national mindsets. And we also see that Euroscepticism is not n uh, necessarily an expression of uh, conservative nationalism, but of some uh, social democratic concern about the viability of the European social model. And what we can learn from the US experience, I think, is at least three things. Don't pretend to be even more of a nation state than the United States. Represent state, uh, respect state rights, as the US do, with in-state, out-of-state tuition, for example. Avoid unfunded mandates. That's bound to uh, um, arouse uh, resistance from the single states and make court rulings more consistent and more transparent. And the, the, the simplest thing, maybe consistency is not possible. They, they had 7,000 judgments so far. I don't know how many Supreme Court rulings there are, but uh, I guess not 27 justices sitting for 7,000 cases is impossible. Of course, that is c accumulated over the decades, you know, the 7,000. But at least you could say 
accept the idea of individual accountability so that we know something about the vote, who was with which reasons for or against this ruling. And that is a secret in Europe. Whereas any European sitting in Berlin at the Social Science Research Center goes to the website and reads what everybody on the Supreme Court said. So in this sense, I would th I think on the federal level of the supranational European Union, we can learn quite a bit from the United States. Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs>